Now, any true biochemistry introduction would fall short if I failed to teach you guys about nucleic acid chemistry in all their quagtastical glory. Yes, I did just make up a name. Quagtastical. It won't be on the test. Now, this is our chapter's to-do list. After studying this chapter, I expect you to be able to do each of the following things. Describe the molecular structure of nucleic acids. Be familiar with the names and structures of the five nucleic, uh, nucleotide bases and know which ones are complementary to each other. Know the difference between nucleosides and nucleotides. Explain nucleic acids base pairing pattern. Explain why DNA lacks a two prime hydroxyl group. Explain how hereditary traits are passed on through DNA replication. Understand what transcription and translation are. Explain how proteins are formed through RNA translation. And explain how the polymerase chain reaction or PCR works. Now just so you know, we'll be skipping sections 2, 7, 10, and 14. Now this is a huge to-do list. So let's get started, all right? As I mentioned back in chapter 21, one of the most important family groups of nitrogen heterocycles is that of the purines and pyrimidines. Now, purines and pyrimidines have the basic structure shown here on this slide. As you may have learned in biology courses, adenine and guanine are the two nucleotide purines, while cytosine, uracil, and thymine are the pyrimidines. These five nitrogen heterocycles together constitute the five nucleotide bases found in DNA and or RNA. Now you've heard me say this before, but I have a special way of distinguishing between purines and pyrimidines. Structurally, I remember that purines are larger because the word purine is smaller than the word pyrimidine. I realize that makes absolutely no sense, but I've never forgotten it. I just remember that their generic names, purine and pyrimidine, are inversely uh, related to their size. That is, because purine has fewer letters in its name, I remember that the purine ring structure has more atoms than pyrimidine, and vice versa. Now, to remember the, remember the actual names of the purines and pyrimidines, I remember that adenine and guanine, <clears throat> the two purines, begin with the letters A and G, which spells ag. Because I'm a USU Aggie, and Aggies are pure in heart. It's easy to remember that adenine and guanine, ag, are the purines. Now the pyrimidines, cytosine, uracil, and thiamine, begin with the letters C-U-T, which spells the word cut, while an ag, or Aggie, is pure. An infected cut, cytosine, uracine, and thiamine, is not. Hence. The cut heterocycles are the pyrimidines. Purines and pyrimidines are the nucleotide bases found in nucleic acids, but they are only one component of those nucleic acids. The nucleic acids themselves are actually long polymers whose structures I'm going to describe to you now. now I'll begin by describing to you the structure of our first topical nucleic acid, known as deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. I do expect you to understand DNA structure sufficiently well to be able to describe or explain it to your peers, and ultimately to me, on an exam. So here it is. As you can see in this figure, purines and pyrimidines, shown here in the middle, hydrogen bond to each other. In DNA, each purine or pyrimidine base is attached to carbon-1 of a five-atom ringed sugar called deoxyribose. In other words, if I were to number around the carbons found in this sugar, like this, you would see that the nucleotide base is bound to C1, or carbon 1, of the sugar. Now these ribose sugars are bound together in turn by a phosphate backbone, as shown here, with the phosphates being attached to carbon 3 at the sugar above them, and to carbon-5 at the sugar below them. In other words, as we scan down this DNA strand, I can say that each phosphate is bound to carbon-3 in the sugar above it, and to carbon-5 in the sugar below it, if I were counting around the ring of each ribosugar in between.
Another way of saying it is that as I scan down the DNA th strand here, I can say that this phosphate sugar backbone runs from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end in this direction. Or if I were scanning in the other direction, I could say from the 3 prime end to the 5 prime end. Thus, we can say that each DNA strand consists of nucleotide bases that are linked together by sugar phosphate backbone running in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction. The two DNA strands have complementary base pairing, adenine hydrogen bonds with thiamine and guanine hydrogen bonds to cytosine. While one DNA strand runs in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction, the other DNA strand runs in a complementary but opposing uh, way, 5 prime to 3 prime, as shown here. We can say then that these two complementary DNA strands are anti-parallel to each other. Now a great source of confusion that I faced as a young science student came from my inability to make the connection between how the structure of DNA actually related to the structure of chromosomes. I had learned from my many biology teachers that DNA contains the information that codes for all of our physical traits. I had also learned that through meiosis these traits are passed on with recombination to reproductive cells, and that through mitosis they are passed on to duplicating cells during eukaryotic cell division, all through the division of chromosomes. What I lacked was the ability to see the connection between chromosomes and DNA. Do chromosomes contain DNA? I wondered. Is DNA located inside the chromosomes or is it somewhere else in the cell? I just didn't know and none of my teachers that I can remember had really explained that to me very clearly. To help reduce this confusion for you, I've assembled a few slides that you'll hopefully find illuminating. To begin, I should explain that if we zoom out in perspective, this sugar phosphate backbone looks kind of like this with the two complementary strands running in anti-parallel 5 prime to 3 prime or 3 prime to 5 prime directions as you see here. For your reference I've drawn a box around the adenine, thiamine and guanine cytosine pairs which when zoomed out look like this. This is the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Now these two anti-parallel strands are not rigid and linear like a ladder, but actually twist and rotate into a helix around a common axis, with the base pairs being planar and parallel to each other inside the helix. We can say then that DNA's secondary structure is a twisting double helix, as shown in these computer models. This is illustrated here with figures A and C with figure B showing the view that we would see if we were actually staring down the barrel of the helix. This double helix structure over here has two alternating grooves in it called the major groove, which is the larger one, and the minor groove, which is the smaller one. From another perspective, we might envision that these two complementary strands look kind of like this a twisting pink ribbon with the colored complementary shapes representing the nucleotide bases in between. Once again, this is the structure of DNA. Now our cells package DNA into the nucleus by wrapping it around special proteins called histones, which are sort of like a wheel that we might use to wrap and store a garden hose. These histones in turn are clustered into groups that we call nucleosomes, which are then wrapped around in a larger structure shown here called chromatin fiber. Chromatin fiber, which is made up once again of numerous histone clusters called nucleosomes wrapped up uh, with DNA, then coils to form the chromosome superstructure shown here. So this is my summary of how packaged DNA really does make up the larger chromosome structure. As you may remember, remember from your biology classes, human somatic cells, which are non-reproductive cells, contain 46 chromosomes, while our reproductive cells, sperm and eggs, contain 23 chromosomes. In all, these human chromosomes contain about 3.1 billion nucleotide base pairs, constituting the entire human genome, which uniquely codes for every one of our physical traits. One question you might ask is, 
how are our individual cells able to find a specific sequence of DNA in all of this mess and then use it to make a specific protein right when they need it? That is an amazingly cool question, but I won't give you the answer until I teach you biochemistry during a later semester. Sorry. Now, the DNA Learning Center at Cold Harbor Spring Laboratory in Laurel Hollow, New York, has produced a series of incredibly useful videos for teaching molecular genetics. I find one particular video of theirs to be most instructive for our current subject, how chromosome structure actually relates and is composed of the individual uh, nucleotide bases found in our DNA. I've posted the HTML for that YouTube video right here for you to examine later. I am going to show it for you right now just so you can see it. In this animation we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up to fit into the nucleus of every cell. The process starts with assembly of a nucleosome which is formed when eight separate histone protein subunits attach to the DNA molecule. The combined tight loop of DNA and protein is the nucleosome. Multiple nucleosomes are coiled together and these then stack on top of each other. The end result is a fiber of packed nucleosomes known as chromatin. This fiber, which at this point is condensed to a thickness of 30 nanometers, is then looped and further packaged using other proteins which are not shown here. This remarkable multiple folding allows six feet of DNA to fit into the nucleus of each cell in our body, an object so small that 10,000 nuclei could fit on the tip of a needle. The end result is that the DNA is tightly packed into the familiar structures we can see through a microscope, chromosomes. Now, structurally speaking, RNA, which is short for ribonucleic acid, looks very, very much like DNA with two major differences. First of all, RNA has hydroxy groups, these OH groups, at the C2 position of each ribose sugar in its backbone. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Why does it have deoxy in its name? Well, it's because DNA lacks the 2 prime hydroxyl group found in RNA. Second, you'll notice that where DNA has thiamine as its complementary nucleotide base to adenine, RNA substitutes uracil in thiamine's place. Thus, in DNA, A pairs with T, and in RNA, A pairs with U. In both DNA and RNA, G pairs with C. Functionally, DNA has to remain intact throughout a cell's lifespan. RNA, in contrast, is formed and used and then recycled transiently in the cell when needed. Why? Because RNA's primary role is to serve as an intermediary between DNA and making proteins. That's it. So why does DNA really lack a 2 prime hydroxyl group? Well, as it turns out, having a 2 prime hydroxyl group makes a nucleic acid relatively unstable. Here's how. As we can see, in RNA, we have a 2 prime hydroxyl group in the sugar phosphate backbone. Because of that, if that RNA is exposed to base, even mild base, this kind of rearrangement can occur. The base grabs the hydrogen off of the 2 prime hydroxyl group, dumps these electrons into the phosphate phosphorus, and thrusts them up onto the oxygen. This then closes and kicks off this group, which then in turn uh, steals the proton back to protonate this 5 prime hydroxyl group. This generates a 2 prime, 3 prime prime cyclic phosphodiester shown here. What's the whole point of my showing you this? Well, the point is this. RNA's 2 prime hydroxyl group makes it easier to cleave apart RNA sugar phosphate backbone. Uh, DNA does not have that 2 prime hydroxyl group, which is necessary to prevent DNA from decomposing similarly. Hence, 
the deoxy part of DNA's infamous name. So let's see if we can hit some example questions. Okay? <laughs> Here's the first one. If one of the strands of DNA has the following sequence of bases running in the 5 prime 3 prime direction, can you tell me what is the sequence of bases in the complementary strand of DNA? I also want you to tell me what base is closest to the 5 prime end in the complementary strand. Here's a second question. Why do both thymine and uracil specify the incorporation of adenine? Now I hate to spoil things for you guys, but I'm actually not going to answer these questions here in this video presentation. For that, you'll have to show up to class. <laughs> Now I have to pause here to point out something that I'm sure you guys have already figured out. We scientists name everything. And we don't just give stuff simple names like Pete. We give stuff big, hairy names with lots of syllables. So let's look at these compounds. You'll notice that they are nothing more than just the nucleotide bases I introduced you to earlier, except that they're bonded to ribose sugars. Do you think that we scientists give these compounds their own specific names? Of course we do. We're scientists. We name everything just to create more stuff for our students to have to memorize. In fact, I named every raisin in my breakfast cereal this morning. OK. <laughs> so there are three different commonly used terms that confused the snot out of me when I was first learning this subject. These terms are nucleotide base, nucleoside, and nucleotide. It turns out that each of these terms are actually referring to something different. I just didn't know what the heck that difference was. Now I do, and I'm going to explain it to you. So when we make reference to a nucleotide base, we are just talking about adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thiamine, just by themselves. A nucleotide base is any of these compounds by themselves not bonded to a ribose sugar or a phosphate backbone. A nucleoside, in contrast, is a nucleotide base bonded to a sugar. And you guessed it, these compounds are called nucleosides. So if I have any of these nucleotide bases that are bonded to just a sugar, we no longer call them nucleotide bases, we call them nucleosides. Nucleotide bases, once again, are adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thiamine. Their nucleoside counterparts are called adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, and uridine in RNA. <coughs> and in DNA, they're called 2 prime deoxyadenosine, 2 prime deoxyguanosine, 2 prime deoxycytidine, and thymidine. A nucleotide, in contrast, which is a little bit different from a nucleoside, is a nucleotide base plus a sugar plus a phosphate group. When all three of these elements are bonded together, we call that type of molecule a nucleotide. The nucleotide names are pretty simple, really. We just take the name of the nucleoside from which it came, add a number which corresponds to which carbon on the ribose ring the phosphate is bonded to. And then we add the term monophosphate, diphosphate, or triphosphate. So this nucleotide right here is called adenosine 5 prime monophosphate. This one is called 2 prime deoxycytidine 3 prime monophosphate. So once again, if we took the phosphate off, this would be a nucleoside. And this nucleoside would be called adenosine. Because we've added a phosphate, and the phosphate happens to be stuck to carbon 5 on the ribose ring, we call it 5' prime monophosphate at the end, with the adenosine at the beginning of the name. I hope that makes sense. If this molecule over here did not have this phosphate group, it would be a nucleoside, not a nucleotide. And the nucleoside that it would correspond to would be 2 prime deoxycytidine, because it does not have a hydroxyl group here on the sugar. Because we add a phosphate group, and it happens to be on the 3 prime position, we call it 3 prime monophosphate at the end, and leave the corresponding nucleoside name, 2 prime deoxycytidine, at the beginning. 
Now, although it's not used to store or transmit genetic information, like DNA or RNA, ATP is also a nucleotide. Its full name is adenosine 5' prime triphosphate. Once again, you can see that if we took away these phosphates, this would be adenosine, the nucleoside. Because we've added a triphosphate group onto the 5' prime position of this ribose sugar, its full name is adenosine 5' prime triphosphate. Now here's a chart that shows the full names of the nucleotide bases, their nucleosides, and deoxynucleoside counterparts, and their corresponding nucleotide and deoxynucleotide names. I hope that clarifies the concept of nucleotide bases, nucleosides, and nucleotides for you. It's a clarification that I personally wish that I would have had when I was an undergraduate first learning this stuff back in the day. <laughs> now we've come a long way today. I hope it's been as long, <laughs> I mean as fun for you as it has been for me. So let's take a break and then we'll come back shortly to tackle the second and final half of this chapter on nucleotide chemistry.